Uh, good morning and welcome to the Tuesday, May 16th County Commission meeting. Would you stand for the pledge, please? Again, good morning and uh, welcome. A reminder to silence your cell phones, please. Meeting documents are available next to Commissioner Bender. And if you need a listening device, Carol can help you with that. With that, we'll go to routine business. Uh, the first item is a, to consider a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. A motion and a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item two is to approve the commission minutes from May 9th. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve. Any changes, corrections? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item three is bills to be paid of three million three hundred and forty-one thousand three hundred and twenty-six dollars and thirty cents. Pay, pay the bills. bills. Second. A motion and a second to pay the bills. Any input? All those in favor of approval say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Uh, reports that are filed that we have the auditor's account for the county treasurer as of April 30th, the county juvenile detention center report as of April 2017th, and the county coroner report. Uh, item five, our personnel actions. Item A is to consider a motion to approve the routine personnel action. Motion to approve. Second. A motion and a second to approve routine personnel. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Item B is to consider a motion to approve the special personnel action request. Um, item number one is to convert one senior deputy public defender in the public defender's office to the senior trial attorney and to approve immediate internal recruitment of the promotional opportunity. Good morning, Carrie. Good morning, Carrie Deaver from Human Resources. This is a request to create um, or to convert an existing position to a senior trial attorney to oversee the misdemeanor section of the PDO. Tracy Smith is here if you have any questions on the briefing memo that she attached for you. Does anyone have any questions for Carrie? Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the special personnel action request. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item two is to approve classification and compensation changes to address market-related issues effective June 3rd. Carrie? I have a few requests for you this morning. The specific requests are all outlined on the personnel memo for you. Um, I know that you're all aware that every year we do a salary review of our salaries in Minnehaha County, and we analyze the data by using a database that was provided to us from our consultants during our last compensation study. I think you realize too that there seems to be a growing trend where we're needing to make more exceptions to salary policy than we have in the past. So as we analyze that data, I don't know that we found anything surprising this spring. We just found data that reinforced what we're seeing as issues. And those issues is that um, overall, thankfully, um, our salary ranges do show that we're still competitive in most areas. However, in some very specialized technical or upper management positions, we're seeing that our salaries are lagging market and sometimes we're lagging by as much as 10% or even more. It's a difficult challenge then to determine how do you fix that when there's these isolated areas in the matrix that there's concerns. There's no overall approach that we can apply. Our office looked at the data. We reached out to Dr. Condry, who helped us with one of our previous classification and compensation studies to look at that and say, you know, is there any good approaches that we can go ahead and implement that can help us be a little bit more competitive so that we can continue to attract and retain well-qualified staff. Out of those conversations came several recommendations that I have for you this morning. The first is the only blanket adjustment that I would say that there is. What we're noticing again is that we're having difficulties or challenges in some of the upper management or technical specialized positions and a lot of those are falling between pay grades 21 and 26. So what I have as a first recommendation for you is we would like your support in adjusting the pay ranges for those positions by 5%. So the way we would do this is right now between our pay grades, there's a 5% between each pay grade until you get to pay grade 22. 
and the gap between 21 and 22 is 10 percent. What we would recommend is that we move down that gap to between 20 and 21 and start that transition point there instead. And that has the domino impact of raising the pay grades for 21 through 26 by 5 percent. I found it interesting as we're having those conversations with Dr. Condry. We went back and pulled his original recommendation to the commission back in 2008 and lo and behold that was the structure that was recommended then. As I recall we did make some changes in that to try and conserve some costs so really the structure is not outside of what was originally recommended. To do this there would be a fairly significant cost if you actually looked at adjusting the salaries of the staff in that and I know that's something that the commission is not in a position to do and it would be a significant cost increase. So what we're recommending is that we make the increase in the salary ranges but we don't adjust anybody's current rate of pay. What it would allow us to do is still to offer more competitive rates of pay with market because it would be 5 percent higher and the staff in those positions would have an increased earning potential of 5 percent. But if you support this what we would recommend is no salaries change just the ranges and the individuals in those pay grades would move back two steps which is the 5 percent. Again their salary wouldn't be pulled back just their step placement. That is the first recommendation and I have three more for you. I don't know if you want to take these individually or if you want me to present everything and then open it up. Uh, let's take them individually for now. It, I guess first of all is there any questions for the first item? Commissioner Bender. I don't, I don't really have a question as much as a comment. I just would really like to thank Carrie and her staff for the work that they've put into this. This has been a challenging um, problem for us and they've spent a lot of time um, doing the research, talking to the experts, working with, with department heads um, to make sure that everybody is on board and I think this makes a lot of sense and I'd make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, all those in favor of the first option, please say yes. Those yes. That aye. Are aye. <laughs> 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 You're trying to confuse us. I'm sorry. <laughs> Change is just difficult, isn't it? Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. The motion unanimously passes. Second item, please. I'd mention that all of these are targeted for positions that we're particularly struggling with. And you'll recall back in 2015, we did an adjustments for our attorneys. When I say that our pay ranges are lagging by 10 percent, sometimes more, this is one case where we definitely see that the ranges are not competitive. We made those adjustments in August 2015 in a hope to more closely mirror market. We knew then that it wasn't going to be a perfect fix, and it hasn't been. We're still struggling in attracting and retaining staff in that area. Um, so the next request that I have for you is to eliminate the use of pay grade 21 for our entry level attorneys. So right now there's basically two that we have entry level at 21 and our senior deputies which are 22. We do have senior trial attorneys but it's not a natural progression. Um, our staff automatically promote after two years or when they're ready to take on a higher caseload or a more serious load like felony load for that senior deputy level um, position. We'd like to eliminate the use of 21 just because um, if we were to do that we'd be able to increase the salary ranges for those attorneys by that additional 5 percent that all ranges are moving up. For the rest of the staff there's no cost in doing that because you can move people back two steps. For the attorneys because of where we're hiring and the compression that we have if you make this adjustment we would need to adjust some staff member salaries to get to the minimum of the base. Um, so what I'm proposing is if you're supportive of this, we would eliminate the use of pay grade 21. We would hire all attorneys and at a pay grade 22 instead. The first two steps would be considered the deputy level and anything above that would be considered senior. Um, so there'd be no more promotional process. People would simply transition through. If you're supportive, again, we would have to bring everybody's salary to at least the base. And as we looked at this, we saw that some people were eligible to promote later in June and July. We had some in August. Since they're so close, we would also recommend that if a staff member were eligible to promote this year, that we go ahead and give them that promotion effective right away with the effective date for all of these. 
In addition, we saw that some people were close to their step date. So what I've done is I've attached a list to the memo for you to review. All those increases, and there's about 19 staff who'd be impacted, are to make sure we're getting people to the base, providing them with the promotion they would have received, or making some minor equity adjustments to make sure that there's no leapfrogging and that people stay sort of in line with the seniority that they have right now. There is a small cost to do this um, because we are raising salaries. It's under $14,000 for the remainder of the year. Full transparency, of course, that's gonna impact your budget in 2018. But I would just point to the cost of turnover as a way of recouping this. I mean, if we're not able to attract and retain, we have our current staff trying to cover for those positions, or as with turnover, you know that there's, of course, a lot of cost in that. So I'm hopeful you'll support this one as well. Questions for Carrie? Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item three. As we were looking through, again, they're technical specialized positions. The last two have to do with requests to reclassify positions. The first two things we we're talking about were really salary range adjustments and trying to move people up. I do have two requests for, or actually three requests for reclassifications. The first is um, we're recommending reclassification of the Director of Information Technology from a pay grade 24 to a pay grade 25. This is being recommended for two reasons. Here too, we're seeing that the market data shows that we're currently paying this position more than 10% below market. In addition, this position has changed since it was originally classified back in 2007 and 2008. And so for that reason, we're recommending the pay grade change as well as a compensation adjust adjustment for Madi Wadenbach, who's currently in that position. And that would be consistent with the reclassification process. Thank you. Questions? Is there a motion? There is. Second. A motion and a second to approve the third recommendation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. No problem there either. All right. The final one has to do with our project engineers. Again, an area where while the position duties aren't necessarily changing, we're just finding that our salaries are far below where they need to be with market. So we're recommending reclassifying the project engineer position from a pay grade 19 to a 21 and the senior project engineer from a 21 to 22. These positions are currently vacant, so we don't have anyone in, in them, so there's no immediate cost impact. Thank you. Is there questions for Kerry? I guess I'm just going to make another comment. You know, one, the Kerry's incredibly persuasive and has done a really good job of explaining all this, so that might be the reason there are not too many questions. But we have really been, you know, thinking about these issues and talking about them. The reason that the senior engineer position is currently vacant is because we haven't been able to attract a candidate that's qualified, and so um, these are all very necessary steps to continue to provide the services that Minnehaha County residents expect and deserve. So I would make a motion to approve. Second. Uh, I'll just make one comment. I think I mentioned this to you last week when we were talking. Uh, there was an article in the USA Today paper about the individuals coming out of college and the five or six uh, fields that they ought to pursue because of the demand and the market changes. And I think we hit three out of those five with today's conversation. So uh, this is something that we have to do if we're gonna continue to be, at least try to be competitive, but more important, keep the good people that we have. So, Commissioner Mr. Chair, Barth. I was watching uh, uh, the news this morning and uh, they were talking about the worldwide uh, hack uh, that's affected computer systems in 160 countries. And the concluding comment was, uh, go home and give all your IT people a raise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will just put in a plug for IT people because uh, uh, we had a conversation with an individual from Dakota State about multiple things, and um, all of their graduates have jobs before they finish college, and they all start with six-figure incomes wherever they want to go. So it's a great opportunity for those young people who have an IT interest, and that happened to be the number one recruitment issue across the country, so. And just sort of to mirror some of these comments, 
again, you know, I'm very happy with what the commission does for our staff and salary ranges. It's just that we are struggling in some of these very specific areas. And I want to be upfront that what we're doing here is lessening the gap. We're not closing it. When I'm talking 10% behind mark in some of these positions when we're doing a 5% adjustment, it's what we can do, but I just want to be upfront that I may be in front of you at some point in the future. Well, we have to acknowledge the problem before we can fix it. So um, I appreciate all your hard work and doing all the research and all the input that everybody's had about that, so thank you. I think we have a motion and a second. <laughs> Is there all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank, thank you. We'll you. get those um, process and effective June 3rd. Thank you. Uh, item six is an application for abatement. Olivia. All right. So I'm going to do A through F first. Um, G and H were deferred from last week. So for A, we have City of Sioux Falls RDID 88578 for 2016 property taxes in the amount of $4,161.25. Then we have RDID 42102 for veteran exemption, 2016 property taxes in the amount of $1,609.03. Then we have RDID 42571 for the veteran exemption, 2016 property taxes in the amount of $1,521.31. Then we have RDID 60963, Veteran Exemption, 2016 Property Taxes, $3,795.34. Then RDID 72521 for Veteran Exemption, 2016 Property Taxes in the amount of $340.02. And then RDID 25322 for the veteran exemption 2016 property taxes in the amount of $1,521.32. Any questions for Olivia? I think we can take item A through F as one motion. That's my motion to approve. Second. A motion and a second to approve items A through F. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Let's do item G separately. So for item G, it's Hills of Rest Memorial Park, RDID 88527, 2016 property taxes for $5,428.82. And this was deferred from last week, and I believe the Director of Equalization did submit a memo explaining um, that information. Uh, Diane, do you have any further comments other than the written explanation or... Good morning, Commissioners. Corey Dash with the uh, Director of Equalization Office. Um, we did submit a memo on that. The uh, explanation is basically that this property was um, created in, in uh, 2015. The value was established for 2016. It should have been exempt, and it was not. And um, that's what the abatement is for. Okay. The property has been combined now with the rest of the uh, cemetery. Uh, any questions for Corey? Is there a motion? I'll make the motion, sir. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to approve item G. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item H is the city of Sioux Falls. It's RDID 38209, and we also have an explanation for that. Corey, do you have any comments? Um, this property again was purchased by the city of Sioux Falls and um, their portion we are they're abating um, one month's worth of property taxes in the amount of six hundred and fifty eight dollars and seventy seven cents questions mr. chairman uh, they, their explanation to me over this past week certainly satisfied me so I'll make a motion to approve this second we have a motion and a second to approve all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed motion unanimously passes Thank you. Uh, no notices and requests, no planning and zoning notices. Item nine is a petition to compromise for $375. Good morning, Melinda. Good morning, commissioners. Melinda Storley, commission assistant. Before you is petition for compromise of lien DPNO 40600, which represents public defender fees in the amount of $375. The lien was recorded on March 23rd, 2017. 
under the name of both the petitioner and the ex-spouse. <clears throat> However, they've been divorced since August 15th, 2007. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the petitioner is requesting that his name be removed from the joint lien with no payment and that the lien remain in full against his ex-spouse. I've provided both a divorce decree and the public defender expense report showing that um, <clears throat> the lien is in the name of the ex-spouse. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions for Melinda? Yeah, and this is pretty cut and dried. I'll make a motion to approve uh, that plan. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the petition for compromise. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, opposed nay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now to an opportunity for public comment. And Monty, I know you have some guests with you this morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Monty Wadenbach with Minnehaha County IT Department. Uh, just stopping in to stay, say hi and introduce. I've got um, uh, Keith and Tam from Barry Dunn and Adam and Shauna from Teller Technologies. Um, they are here today to um, speak to the, the department heads at a kickoff meeting this afternoon and also to go through an implementation plan and to, to get all of those plans and dates and whatnot as um, concrete as we can at this point. Um, so anyways, just wanted to just stop by and, and let you know that we're getting the process started here. Um, so we're at the very beginning of a, a very large project. This may be one of the largest or the largest software uh, conversion that I can remember for sure. And I think that uh, we'll be moving up into the new century for a change and have the ability to have uh, not only a sophisticated system, but one that uh, meets all the needs of the county as it continues to grow. And frankly, it puts everybody on the same page, which is uh, exactly what we need to have happen. Do, do you have any comments that you'd like to make? Um, we don't want you to just come here and sit and look at us. <laughs> you're gonna, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to come to the microphone and introduce yourself. Thank you. This is Keith Damon with Barry Dunn. I just wanted to say that we're excited to get the project started. We've been working with the county now for a number of years, so it's good to hit this spot and when there's a lot of work in front of us, but we've uh, made good progress to date, so thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Commissioner Heiberger? Comment would be, when I came here seven years ago and we looked at what our software package was, it was daunting and overwhelming and we didn't have any money and we thought, how are we gonna do this? And because of dedicated staff and just the way we've watched our budget, we've been able to come forward. So it's, it's nice to still be on the commission and see that we're actually moving forward with new software and it's a very exciting day for us. So thank you for being here and what you're doing. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Monty, and thank you for your leadership. <coughs> thank you again for being here. We appreciate your support, that's for sure. Any other opportunities for public comment? If not, we'll go to uh, item 10, which is a public hearing to consider an application for a special on-sale wine retailers license for Siouxland Renaissance Association, June 10th and 11th at the Lions Fairground. Olivia. Yes, uh, we received the application from the Renaissance Association and there were no concerns or objections reported by the Sheriff's Department, State's Attorney's Office, or Planning and Zoning Department. Any questions for Olivia? Move to approve. Thank second. you. Mr. Chairman. It's a public hearing. Did we get a second? Oh, I did second, Thank sorry. Thank you. We it's a public hearing. Yeah, yep. we have to have comments. And yep. There's nobody here that wants to talk about that. I, I thought we'd have a renaissance. We That's what my complaint was going to be. Yeah. By the attire of the folks in yeah. the audience, usually I figured they we come did in not. Costume so. Usually <laughs> have an in costume regale us with ancient English. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, she now works for my office, so I wouldn't let her off the. <laughs> <laughs> you should have come in attire then. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we do have a motion and a, and a second, but is there anybody that would like to make a comment? Yeah. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. We want them back next year, Olivia. Okay. <laughs> 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 or otherwise the chairman has to dress up uh, that's it good thing there'll be a new chairman <laughs> <clears throat> item number 11 is to consider a motion to authorize the Minneapolis county sheriff's office to sign a vehicle lease agreement with Vern ID 
for one vehicle at a cost of $295 per month through December 31st. This is an HIDA program fund reimbursable expense. Mr. Bosman, how are you? Good morning, Commissioners. Joe Bosman with the Sheriff's Office. Uh, what do I have for your approval this morning is to authorize the Sheriff's Office to sign a vehicle lease with Vern ID Motor Cars. And what this is for is this is for a vehicle that is used by our drug investigator with the Sheriff's Office. Uh, the expense is going to be reimbursed through a HIDA program, which stands for High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program. Uh, it's a federal program we've been participating with since 2005. It's uh, been beneficial to us for salary reimbursements, uh, training equipment, and uh, vehicles as well, too, which kind of help us offset some of the you know, growing personnel and make new with the vehicles that we have. Thank you. Any questions? Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Question. Certainly. I didn't look at the terms of the lease. Is there, you know, any concerns with like mileage restrictions, that type of typical thing on a lease? I mean, are we going to, it's only a year and a half, which is a very short lease. And, and it's for that is because it's the HIDA grant is something that is renewed periodically. So we don't want to go too far out um, just in case the federal government would ever decide at some point, you know, we're going to stop this. We want to be able to, um, you know, not keep going and be stuck with the lease at that point. Uh, Vern ID has been very good with us that they are not putting any mileage restrictions on it. They want to help law enforcement. They said, we want to provide for you guys as a service. Um, They're going to be taking care of the maintenance on the vehicle. Um, they just, we have the option to switch it out periodically because as part of drug investigations, maybe you might need to change your vehicle every so often just to kind of keep it fresh. <laughs> um, and so they are perfectly fine that we just, we have a written agreement that we can change it out as many times as we need in the middle of this lease agreement. So it's not specific to one vehicle either. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, item 12 is to consider an appeal of a decision by the Minnehaha County Planning Commission to approve the conditional use permit 17-24 <laughs> to allow temporary retail sales of fireworks on a property legally described as listed on Highway 38. Good morning. Yes, Kevin Hookman, County Planning Department. Uh, as you just heard, this is an item for firework sales. It will be nine days firework sale request. Uh, J June 27th through July 5th. Uh, the property is uh, highlighted on the map in front of you at the corner of Highway 11 and Highway 42, uh, about a mile east of Sioux Falls. Uh, the, uh, this was appealed uh, after the Planning Commission meeting. The Planning Commission unanimously, unanimously approved this item uh, on the consent agenda. Uh, as nobody was opposed to the item uh, at the meeting. Um, the petitioner is here. We do have a site plan if you want to see that. I believe right below. It shows uh, that there's room for tent uh, storage and parking at the, the site. Does okay. so anyone have any questions for Kevin? Uh, would the Chairman, I, I would just point out that uh, Kevin, at our meeting of the Planning Commission, uh, this was approved on the consent agenda because nobody felt any reason to object to it. And then after we approved it based on the fact no one was opposed, even though the opponent was present at the meeting, uh, now he's com not wanting it. Correct. The, the individual who appealed the, this item was present at the meeting as well. Okay. Thanks. Any questions for Kevin other than the presentation? Uh, would the petitioner like to make a few comments? Sure, yeah. Um, it's good to see you guys again. It's been <laughs> been about, I don't know, a year and two weeks. Yeah. So <laughs> anniversary, you might as well hang out with you guys. <laughs> I apologize, that is probably the worst paint job that I could do, but that's as technologically savvy as I can get in terms of a map. But at any rate, um, he brought up just a couple points that we are addressing, so um, he is a competitor of mine, and so that was kind of a shock to me. Uh, I have a really good relationship with him. I actually you know, got along with him last year, and then uh, the letter came through, and I was like, oh, man, that, that kind of stinks. You know, competitor wants to take me out, but that's all right. So at any rate, we're going to use Lacey's Rentals to uh, have a bathroom, and that was one of his, his concerns. 
And we, if you want any restrictions from kids running in the road, we do have flags that could prevent that. Um, but there are three other fly, uh, other fireworks retailers on that highway, and so I don't think any kids are going to run into the highway that they wouldn't run um, normally. But at any rate, I appreciate the time, um, and hopefully, hopefully, I look forward to actually making that plan happen. So, do you want to give us your name and address, please? Uh, f- my personal one. Yeah. Um, Andy Jorgensen, 1604 South Williams Avenue. Thank you. Any questions for Andy? Mm-hmm. Move to approve. Second. Commissioner? Oh, I would uh, just say, uh, K- Kirsten has his finger in the air here. It, you should probably call for any other people that want to speak, either proponents or opponents. I recognize from the, from everybody field. here. I, I know, but <laughs> for the sake of the record, I feel like I say that. Is all. there anyone else who wants to consider <laughs> a conversation? <laughs> <laughs> You're out of order. <laughs> Thank no. you for indulging me. You're welcome. <laughs> Commissioner Barth. I just want to say that uh, seeing Andy again is is a great thing. I, I really think he's the kind of entrepreneur that uh, we need in this county, in this community, and I hope you open another dozen businesses. <laughs> Any other comments? We have a motion and a second, correct? To approve the permit. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. You're still in business. <laughs> Item 13 is to authorize the chair to sign a professional service agreement between the county and civil design for final engineering design for structure 50 130 193. DJ. Good morning, Commissioner. DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. Uh, the Highway Department has received. Uh, the uh, type, size, and location study, or the prelimi- preliminary engineering study for this uh, project, and we wish to move forward with the for, uh, final design. Uh, this bridge is approximately uh, three miles west of Ellis on a township roadway. And uh, if you remember me talking about this structure before, we wanted to move it forward in our program simply because of some construction uh, going on just a little bit south of here with the state project. Uh, there are a lot of gravel pits in and around this area. And so uh, the contractors had uh, made us aware that this is a route that they are going to be taking during construction. And, uh, and they're hoping that we can replace the bridge uh, to get the load limits removed uh, prior to the state's construction project. So uh, hoping to move forward today with the, uh, with the final design and, and either construction uh, maybe this winter or this fall or, or next year, depending on how that fits into our schedule. Questions for DJ? Is there a motion? motion. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve the professional services agreement. I do have a question now that we've got past that point. Oh. Uh, to DJ, how many of our bridges are on load limits? We were just talking about that this morning. I think that right now we're about in the mid-20s. Uh, because we're under construction on a few, I can't sit tell you for an exact number, but I th- mid-20s, 25 or so. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions? We have a motion and a second to approve the agreement. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item 14 is to authorize the chair to sign a professional services agreement between the county and Civil Design, Inc. for construction administration services for structure 50-129060. Commissioners, this is a a structure just north of Lyons uh, by about a mile and a half or so. And uh, and the bridge was posted for a reduced load, and we removed a portion of the of the deck uh, to remove the posting just prior to construction to allow for uh, uh, trucks to be able to continue to use the structure until it uh, went under construction. But uh, it's currently under construction, and we're trying to get this agreement executed uh, so the uh, the consultant is able to continue billing out uh, for their hours. And uh, uh, Civil Design Inc. is working on this project and, and hope for your approval here today. Thank you. Uh, questions for DJ? Make a motion to approve. Second. A motion on a sec- second to approve the professional services agreement. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item 15 is a briefing and presentation summarizing the multi intersection 
traffic study by Infrastructure Design Group. Commissioners, uh, we have Phil Gonvaldson here uh, today from Infrastructure Design Group. Uh, IDG, they do a lot of business with us, and we asked them to uh, take a look at 10 or so various intersections around the county. Uh, the, uh, this study kind of started when we, uh, with the Sioux Falls MPO, uh oh, with the Sioux Falls MPO, we, uh, we had a 2040 long range transportation plan that was published uh, just a year and a half or so ago. And hopefully, we get our technical difficulties taken care of here. Uh, and, and that 2040 long range plan, it, it identified certain key areas of development within the county that we knew there were going to be some intersections that, that had some um, uh, poor performance uh, in regards to transportation and, and traffic flows and volumes. And, and so we hired IDG to take a look at, uh, at the current uh, amount of traffic on those intersections and then project out uh, how much traffic we're going to have after some future developments. And so over the course of the last year or so, uh, they've been looking at, at these intersections and, and Phil Gunvaldson with, with IDG is here to uh, present the results of their study. So Phil, if you want to come up and if, if you guys have any questions uh, afterwards, I can come back up. Otherwise, Phil should be able to answer a lot of the, your questions. Thanks, EJ. Hello, Commission. Phil Gunvaldson with Infrastructure Design Group. I want to make sure this works here. Well, a couple of you have already heard this presentation, so you're fortunate enough to sit through it twice. <laughs> Some pretty exciting stuff. Uh, <laughs> as DJ mentioned, the overall objective of the study uh, was to determine the current and future level of service or operational efficiency of these 10 intersections in and around the county uh, and determine any improvements we might be able to make to these intersections. We looked at three years in this study. The existing year of 2016, which is when the traffic counts were conducted, uh, short-term planning year, five years out, 2021, and then the future year, 2040. So we met with DJ and his staff and identified 10 intersections around the county uh, that uh, they've had some concerns with, uh, prior concerns, and then after the uh, MPO's long range transportation plan came out. So I'll just take you through them. Intersection number one is Highway 114 and 149. So that's two miles south of Colton, uh, head, head, and then you head east over to I-29 to get into Sioux Falls. Uh, intersections two and three are just northwest of uh, the new Foundation Park. Intersection three is a mile south of, of Crooks, so that intersection uh, handles uh, southbound to eastbound uh, traffic from Crooks into Sioux Falls. And that's Highway 130 and Highway 137. And then east of that, one mile is Highway 130 and 471st Avenue. And then number four is way over here on the east side of Brandon as you head out east past the golf course. Uh, that is Highway 138 and Highway 109. And then west of Sioux Falls, we have uh, intersection number five, which is uh, Highway 139, which is T. Ellis Road, and Highway 140, which is Maple Street. Uh, and then about five miles west of that is Highway 140 and Highway 151 west of Sioux Falls. Uh, to the south here is Highway 148 and South Dakota Highway 17. And then really we'll talk a lot about on the east side of town, uh, six mile road corridor, really from Madison Street north to Rice Street. So that incorporates the intersection of Madison, Maple, and Rice Street. So we took a look at the existing crash statistics for, the, for these intersections, and what we found was a lot of animal-related crashes, which is pretty typical of, of rural areas, but then some rear end and, and side swipe collisions. Uh, many were weather-related, but we really didn't see a trend or uh, any uh, fatalities out there that would really uh, trigger the need for uh, improvements based on uh, safety concerns. So as DJ mentioned, we looked at the planned improvements, primarily from the Sioux Falls MPO uh, Long Range Transportation Plan. And we're really going to look at two corridors. The Six Mile Road corridor, uh, that's just east of Sioux Falls. So here's Six Mile Road. Brandon's here. 
So Brandon identified a project, which is Holly Boulevard from Six Mile Road east to Sioux Boulevard, which Holly Boulevard is essentially Rice Street. And based on the MPO's grading criteria, that was the top scoring project for Brandon. Uh, also, Park Street, as Brandon calls it, or Maple Street as it is today, that was their fourth highest scoring project. And I should mention those projects aren't funded, but they are on their, uh, their wish list. And a look at Sioux Falls, uh, like number 40 on their list, but still their top tier project was Rice Street from Cleveland Avenue east to Six Mile Road, Madison Street from Six Mile Road west uh, to Sycamore, and then of course Veterans Parkway, which runs uh, about about a uh, half mile or so west of Six Mile Road. Uh, that's going to be fully constructed here in two years, going to connect to I-90. So we're really anticipating a lot of changes in traffic patterns and possibly traffic volumes in the area once that happens. And then the Highway 139 corridor, again, that's T. Ellis Road corridor, just west of Sioux Falls. Uh, there's, Sioux Falls has some um, wish list projects, I guess, that are out there, uh, which is the T. Ellis Road from 12th Street to 57th Street, essentially, and then also from Maple Street north to 60th Street, and then also Maple Street from the T. Ellis Road east to Marion Road. So last fall, uh, the County Highway Department purchased two traffic cameras that we utilized to conduct 48-hour intersection turning movement counts at these 10 intersections. We completed all those counts between October and November of 2016. So the reason for that was to get kind of the worst case scenario. School was in session as well as fall harvest. So we get a lot of truck traffic on those roads, which, which really, uh, uh, really, uh, dictates what the traffic volumes and the level of service will be here. They really affect the, those volumes. In 2021, uh, we, in, we projected the growth up 2%, uh, which is, uh, I won't call it conservative, but it's not aggressive either. Uh, we looked at past trends uh, for growth on these intersections and looked for a uh, a pattern in those moving forward, but with a lot of construction projects, particularly Highway 100, uh, Veterans Parkway going on, uh, there's a lot of detour routes on, on these roads, so sometimes those volumes get skewed. And then in 2040, we used the Sioux Falls MPO travel demand model to uh, derive counts from that model, so intersection turning movement counts. A look at the analysis. We analyzed five scenarios, the existing conditions, which was 2016, and then we took those 2040 traffic counts and put those on the roadway network as it exists today. And then we took the 2021 traffic counts, put those on the roadway network as it exists today. And then we looked at what do we need to do to improve those intersections to handle those new traffic counts. And that's what we looked at as the 2040 improved build and the 2021 improved build. And the way we look at how these intersections operate, the way we grade them is a level of service, simply an A through F grading, and it really uh, measures the operational efficiency of the intersection, and A is the best, and that's where you experience little to no delay, and an F is what we'd call failing, where you have excessive amounts of delay. Uh, in, in rural areas, uh, the State uh, Department of Transportation uh, deems it acceptable for a level of service D or better for, for the entire intersection, uh, or I'm sorry, a level C or better for rural areas. And in Sioux Falls, where drivers are a little more used to handling uh, a little more delay, uh, it's generally accepted to have an intersection level of service D or better. So look at those existing conditions in 2016. A lot of information here, but these are all your intersections on the left, and the e eastbound, westbound, northbound, southbound up top. Basically, in this chart, green is good. Level of service A through C are, are green. Level of service Ds are shown in yellow. Uh, reds are, are Fs, which you can't really see right here. But really, today, 
eight of the ten intersections are operating effectively. <coughs> the two that, that uh, have some delays are Madison Street and Rice Street. On Madison Street, it's the northbound and southbound movements in that a.m. peak hour, so between 7.15 and 8.15. Those northbound and southbound movements are having a tough time navigating that cross-street traffic. And then, as the highway department's already aware of, that northbound movement at Rice Street and Six Mile Road experiences heavy delays in both the a.m. and p.m. peak hours. <coughs> The eastbound and westbound movements still experience a level of service A, of course, because they have no stop signs, so they have a, a free movement. So then we took those intersections forward to 2040, uh, minus the three intersections on Six Mile Road, Madison Street, Maple Street, and Rice Street. The reason why we didn't pull those to 2040 is because it's anticipated that those will be incorporated into the City of Sioux Falls roadway network at, those time, at that time. They'll likely be fully urbanized. So in 2040, uh, we have two intersections that, that really stood out that uh, had some delay issues. Highway 130 and 137, again, that's the, the southbound to eastbound movement out of Crooks to Sioux Falls. So in the AM, the eastbound movement, which is a, a gravel road, that eastbound movement uh, experiences some delay just due to the heavy southbound and leftbound traffic. And we had a couple level service Ds there in the PM. <coughs> Highway 139 and 140, again, that's TLS Road and Maple Street intersection. The eastbound and westbound movements experience level of service Es and Fs, so high amounts of delays there, which gives the overall intersection a failing level of service in the PM peak hour. So then we took those two intersections that failed and brought those back to 2021. Okay, well they don't work in 2040. How do they work five years from now in 2021? And so that's Highway 130 and 137, that uh, southbound out of Crooks. What we show that all movements there operate uh, effectively in 2021. So really nothing to do in the next five years uh, other than possibly just continue to watch the traffic volumes as well as at TLS Road and Maple Street. <clears throat> that all operates at a level of service A or B for the overall intersection as well. So in 2021, we pulled back in those three intersections with Six Mile Road, Madison Street, Maple Street, and Rice Street. And we looked at those, and of course, Madison and Rice Street didn't operate effectively today, so of course they're not going to five years from now without any improvements uh, to the roadways out there. Maple Street, however, uh, which is currently a gravel road, that continues to, to operate effectively. So then we look at recommended improvements. What can we do out there to increase the level of service or the operational efficiency of these intersections? So we look at turn lane warrants. Uh, there's criteria for adding right turn lanes and left turn lanes. These are really a function of the speed limit and the traffic volumes and the number of lanes out there. So we identify if those volumes meet the thresholds to add these lanes. And then we go through with our analysis. We determine what the, the queue length is, stopping at that stop sign. How far does traffic queue up? And we identify based on the speed limit the correct taper lengths uh, and bay tapers and things of that nature so that the turning lanes are designed for safety. So a look at the turning lanes. In 2021, we found five intersections that met warrants for, for turn lanes. Um, it should be noted that some of these intersections in 2021, even though a turn lane is warranted, they still did experience a, a level of service D or better at that intersection. So not necessarily, we don't necessarily need to go out there and construct these turn lanes just because they're warranted, but it, it tells us that if improvements were made to these intersections, then we would want to build the turn lanes at that time um, just so they're up to current standards uh, for safety purposes. As well as 2040, uh, we look, look there, there's four intersections that, that have turn lanes. I should note Highway 148 in South Dakota 17 currently has left turn lanes at all four legs of that intersection uh, and 
well, actually only the eastbound and westbound ones are warranted. Um, but if that lane was, or if that intersection was reconstructed, the turn lanes out there right now aren't long enough, don't have the uh, correct size tapers, so you'd want to reconstruct them to today's standards. So then we look at traffic signal warrants, manual on uniform traffic control devices, uh, identifies nine traffic signal warrants, and at least one of these warrants needs to be satisfied before a traffic signal should go up at an intersection. And a lot of these warrants don't apply uh, in the, the rural situation. So really what we looked at was warrant one, which is your eight hour vehicular volume, warrant two is your four hour, three is your peak hour, uh, and then we looked at a supplemental warrant for always stop control. Again, we didn't look at the crash experience warrant because we identified the, the number of crashes out there uh, would not meet this warrant. So a quick look at the warrants analysis. I know you can't see this, but this is Rice Street and Six Mile Road. So currently out there, that satisfies the warrant one, eight hour, warrant two, the four hour, warrant three, the peak hour. And then anytime those are satisfied, it will also satisfy the always stop control warrant. As well as Rice Street, or I'm sorry, uh, Six Mile Road and Madison Street, that's the only other intersection that currently satisfied some warrants. That did not satisfy the eight hour, but it satisfied the four hour, the peak hour, and then the always stop control. So again, it's, um, don't need to run out and put traffic signals up in these locations, especially since Highway 100 or Veterans Parkway is going to be opening in two years. We really anticipate traffic patterns to uh, fluctuate a little bit, change a little bit once that's constructed. Um, so we recommend monitoring these intersections for the next couple of years, um, possibly redo the traffic counts once that opens again um, and see if the, the signals are still warranted. So then we took those improvements, those turn lane improvements and uh, signal improvements, and we looked at them for the 2040 improved build. So that Highway 130 and 137, that southbound to eastbound movement out of Crooks, uh, we added those turn lanes and we reduced some level of service Fs there. We still have an eastbound left in the AM, so that's one one movement there that's from a gravel road, it's not a whole lot of vehicles. Uh, adding a turn lane there does not get that level of service down to an F. I think we're talking like 15 vehicles in the AM peak hour. So those 15 vehicles experience a little more delay, um, but as you can see, the overall level of service is uh, completely acceptable. And then Highway 139 and 140, Maple Street and TLS Road, uh, the, due to the northbound volumes, northbound, southbound volumes, the westbound traffic does experience some delays in the PM peak hour. Um, but again, there's not a whole lot of traffic for, for that, that westbound movement in the PM peak hour. Uh, and then two, this intersection has a very good chance of being incorporated into the city of Sioux Falls by 2040. So really what these tell us is just continue to, to monitor traffic volumes as development occurs out there. As a little comparison, this was the 2040 unimproved build. So you can see, well, you can't see it, but the, the seconds of delay went down at Highway 130 and 137. And then with those turn lanes that we did add at, one, at uh, TLS Road and Maple Street, uh, we did reduce that overall level of service down to an acceptable range. So then we looked at 2021 improved build. What do we need to do five years from now to get those six mile road intersections uh, to an acceptable level of service? So really at Madison Street and Six Mile Road, uh, if, if uh, you wanted to just play the numbers and have an acceptable level of service out there so you can tell people it's, it's acceptable, uh, currently installing an all-way stop control at that intersection would, would do the trick. Um, always stop controls are, are a good tool to put in place temporarily prior to a, a signal going in, for example. Um, it's my understanding there's not a lot of complaints at this intersection, so it's probably a good idea just to continue to 
operate as a two-way stop for now um, and then monitor traffic volume see what see what it does when uh, Veterans Parkway is constructed and then at Rice Street and Six Mile Road if we simply just add that northbound right turn lane so we have a northbound left and a northbound right but keep it as just a one-way stop for that northbound leg northbound traffic continues to experience excessive delays level service F but due to the high volumes of eastbound westbound traffic the overall level of service is still satisfactory uh, really the only fix there at that intersection is is the traffic signal to to maintain the acceptable uh, level of service um, you know you could do a a three-way stop control there as well uh, if it became an issue while provisions for a traffic signal uh, are made um, but again with Veterans Parkway being opening in two years uh, provided DJ doesn't get too many calls at this intersection uh, it may be worth just uh, monitoring the intersection for two years so we were asked to just kind of put together some planometrics on what uh, some intersections would look like so I just pulled a couple out for this presentation uh, Six Mile Road and Rice Street so there's currently just one northbound left turn lane there these eastbound and westbound left turn lanes currently exist so we would just add a 500 foot long northbound right turn lane and the reason that's 500 foot long is so that people wanting to go right can get into that right turn lane uh, because that left turn lane queues back 500 feet in the a.m. and p.m. peak hour and then this gives the county an idea of any right-of-way th that may be needed uh, if, if that turn lane is installed uh, there's likely going to be some some corners there of right-of-way specifically at this corner that would need need to be obtained as an H lot so then we just taking a look at some other other options within the study this this was one of them uh, this is just for diagrammatic purposes only uh, as I mentioned Sioux Falls and Brandon both have projects that they would like to see constructed on Rice Street uh, as well as Six Mile Road they're all gonna likely be four lane divided arterial roadways at, at some point in the future so if if a signal is warranted um, once Veterans Parkway goes in and it needs to go in you know sooner than later does the county put in a signal now and then the city of Sioux Falls or Brandon gets there 10 years from now and rips all that up rips the turn lane up and the new signal and reconstructs it or can we maybe uh, collaborate a little bit together and try to find one solution possibly a roundabout like this to construct uh, construct together right away so then when those projects tie into them they can just tie in uh, to these legs for example and not have to redo the intersection um, and really this all depends on how the area develops too there there may be a another development access up here this approach here may get moved over to here you know what's going to develop here right now we have a high east-west traffic volume and about a third of that volume on the southbound leg at six mile we'd like to see those equal out a little bit more uh, before a roundabout uh, may, may be justified or practical um, so it really depends if some high traffic volume generators are constructed here uh, then, then it may be an option um, but again this is kind of just for diagrammatic purposes showing uh, the right-of-way lines and some possible future right-of-way may be necessary so in summary uh, we just looked at all ten of these intersections and you know what changes are necessary today in 2021 and in 2040 uh, there are some intersections Madison and Rice that currently satisfy signal warrants um, you know adding the northbound right turn lane at Rice Street and Six Mile and then in 2021 you know as, as I went through there's some turn lanes that are warranted uh, not necessarily going at them right now but just know that they're warranted so when you do look at improvements to those intersections those would want to be designed in with those improvements as well as 2040 a lot of a lot of turn lanes were warranted 
Um, and then important to note, Madison, Maple, and Rice Street with Six Mile Road uh, were not analyzed in this study as they're anticipated to be part of Sioux Falls jurisdiction, or Brandon, I guess, whoever gets there first. So with that, I'll entertain any questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner? No questions. Um, Commissioners Bender, Barth, and I sat um, in this presentation last Thursday at the Urbanized Development Meeting, and um, it's a lot of information, and for most people as a whole, it's probably fills your brain up, but for most people, they're gonna look at this and say, what's my intersection gonna look like? We're having problems here, or, you know, is, a, is this ever gonna get a stoplight or a stop sign or whatever? So I'd encourage people, you know, you can find your intersection or your, the road you travel on pretty easy here. So if you wanna break it down into your own little world, I guess, I encourage people to take a look at this just to find out where they live or what's in their commute to get from here to there. Um, by 2040, I thought we'd have flying cars and <laughs> we didn't have to worry about it. So I, maybe that'll happen, but you know, probably be less confusing than a roundabout for most people too. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But it, a lot of information, and um, yeah, it, just for people to take a look at it and say, hey, for me to get from here to there, what's it going to look like? So thank you, Phil. Yep. And it it provides. Uh, the highway department a tool when they do get calls they can go right back to this and say hey you know it does meet standards it's operating effectively or if it's an intersection that's not included they have the traffic cameras throw them out there you know all the the groundwork is done so it's not too difficult to add another intersection and, and look at that on a complaint basis so thank you other questions Mr. Bender? Well, I just, I'd like to thank the highway department for being really proactive and, and planning ahead for um, how our community is growing and how these um, inter inter check intersections are working. And thank you for the work that you did. And I'm sure you're really thankful that I asked all my questions when we were at UDC and I was really quiet this morning. So, um, but I do live out close to the six mile road. Um, and so I, I I do. I'm, that's part of my commute, so I do experience that. And, and there is a lot of changing traffic patterns, and it will be yep. very interesting to see how um, Veterans Parkway affects all of that. But I'm glad we have tools to be able to see where we are now and, and compare where, where we go and, and what we need to do about it. So thank you. All right. Just a quick question. Um, when you talked at the very beginning, you said you were projecting a 2% growth. But there's certain parts of the community that are going to grow faster than 2% and others that aren't going to grow as fast, obviously. Do you include that in your computations, if you will? Percent traffic volume growth. Oh, okay. Not, not growth, uh, you know, you know, not resident growth. Um. Well, but if you look at the Brandon area and the Foundation Park area, those are going to have more traffic volumes and obviously Highway 100 is projected Correct. to be yep. 50,000 cars a day. Right. So I look at those <coughs> intersections in that area for the last five years. So the Six Mile Road corridor, I looked at that area for the last five years and came up with about one and a half to two somewhere. And then I look out west in the Maple Street area. Those, those existing counts for the last five years. So I project those per area. And they actually all just kind of came out to 2%. Mm. Um, you build it, though, they will come. <laughs> correct. Foundation Park's a big one to, yep. to watch. Um, you all know 471st and Highway 130 there. Have you had these conversations with the city of Brandon? Um, We've sent them the report to review. This is currently in draft format, so it's out to the city of Brandon, uh, the MPO, city of Sioux Falls. They're all currently reviewing it, and then we'll take their comments and incorporate them into the final report. Good. Thank you, Phil. Other questions? If not, We'll go to uh, item 16, which is County Commissioner Liaison Reports. Commissioner Heiberger. Just have one. Our Aaron Sertzka was invited by WYR to um, attend their NACO conference next week, and she will be speaking on justice innovations that we are doing. Um, I think they just called her yesterday. They're going to pay for her trip to go out and back. Um, good time for her to network again with other 
um, NACO individuals. Um, her travel has obviously given us a lot of um, grant opportunities, and um, so very excited that she got invited to go to WYR, and they'll be paying for her whole trip to go again. So, Can you explain what WYR is? Uh, Western Interstate Region. Okay. So it includes South Dakota and then Alaska, and um, she's and going to Oregon. Hawaii so also. Hawaii, that whole area there. So. Um, we actually have several people from South Dakota that attend that, and our we have one that's actually a representative for state of South Dakota from I can't think of his county. Zeebok County. Zeebok County um, represents us, so there'll it's be several other just South a radio D station. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds <laughs> like it does. Yeah, mean. there'll be several other South Dakota representatives going on that trip. Clint Farley in Zeebok has been a commissioner for 42 years. Oof. <laughs> wow, um, Commissioner Barth. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, we've had a couple of meetings on the ambulance issue with uh, uh, with Lindy Young and others. Uh, uh, we had a, a meeting with all the ambulances. Uh, we also had a meeting uh, with uh, Kirsten and Carol and stuff, and we're, we're looking at uh, getting these smaller subcommittees going, uh, Gerald, the, the data committee, the medical committee, the uh, governance committee, and there's one more. Uh, anyway. Uh, so there may be some uh, modifications to the proposed ordinance and maybe the proposed processes. I know that uh, Lindy Young is concerned that, uh, you know, if it uh, drops a load of stuff on his department that he may need some part-time help or something like that, or it's possible that Dr. Luther might need some part-time help because we're talking about uh, the ALS as well as the BLS uh, uh, coverage. And so, uh, anyway, uh, had a couple of meetings on ambulance issues last week, and uh, more to come. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Karski. In addition to UDC last week, I had a library board meeting, and um, library, as you probably were watching the news, changed our program to Family Place Library, and that included a, you know some changes to the actual design of the library, but a lot of it, even like policy changes. Um, you know, example was given, you know, one library, not locally here, but another library. It's hard to be a family library if you don't allow strollers in your library. So just to, you know, make sure that your policies and that type of thing are family friendly. And um, so the Family Place Library is a, as a designation given by a national group, and we have that for our downtown library here, so people are aware of that. Um, Safe Home Board met last week also. Um, the Safe Home concept is alive and well, and the whole project is doing much better than even anticipated, as most of you are aware. And um, the budgetar budgetarily, they are in great shape. So um, that project is one that we had great hopes for years ago, and it's de definitely lived up to its dreams. So. Mm -hmm. Other liaison reports? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, new business, Commissioner Barth. Chairman, uh, I don't know exactly where this would be in categories, but a couple weeks ago we had Dana Lasky from the Friends of the Big Sioux River speak to us, and uh, about two weeks ago we had a one hot day, and a number of the drainage ponds near my home that I drive by on my way down here are now uh, covered with uh, algae bloom. And uh, uh, it's, it's really early in the year, in my opinion, to see that kind of, at first I thought someone had dumped their grass clippings in the pond, uh, but it's, it's actually algae. And uh, as Dana pointed out, you know, our, our lawn chemicals and stuff are applied to excess, wind up going into the water and causing this kind of problem. And, you know, to, uh, and Oftentimes, we uh, like to point the finger at farmers who have uh, cattle, and et cetera, and, uh, you know, have some effect on our water. But, you know, if our goal is, is a, well, at least the goal of the Friends of the Big Sioux River, uh, is to have the Big Sioux be swimmable by 2024, right now it's looking more like it's going to be poisonous. And I'm sorry to see this early bloom because it'll be stinky by the end of the summer. Any other new business? 
Good morning, Carol. Good morning, Carol Muller, Commission Administrative Officer. Just as a reminder, and for those people who are listening today, that next Tuesday we will be having a short commission meeting because we're going to load you all up after that, and we're going to take a tour of the county. We're going to start off going west, we're going to go north, and we're going to come in from the east. So we're excited about that. You're going to get a chance to see some new construction um, that's going on commercial. You're going to get a chance to see some uh, new industrial parks that are being developed in the county, uh, probably take a tour of a road district that just got formed, and and also a CAFO. So we're excited about doing that. We'll be on the road. We're hoping by about 930 and back 4 to 415 at the latest because you will still, you aren't quite done for the day yet at that point because we have a joint meeting at 5 o'clock that day with the city council. So we're excited about that. Any other new business? Old business? I have one uh, topic that uh, has continued to be a an issue for some businesses in the region, uh, and that is the number of a special uh, one-day retailers' licenses off sale, if you, or on sale, if you will. Um, I've had lots of feedback from individuals and organizations who want to expand that. And uh, right now, the county had set the number of licenses at six events. And uh, frankly, the state regulates that, but they don't issue um, a number, as I understand it, for how many there can be. That's a county responsibility, and why it was set at six, I'm not sure. But uh, I've talked to the sheriff, I've talked to the state's attorney, talked to the clerks. Uh, no one is against this. In fact, uh, everybody thinks that it would be uh, to our advantage to have additional licenses. The sheriff indicated that he's had no concerns or uh, significant events. And in fact, uh, he appreciates the fact that he knows where they're at if there is some particular event going on. There is a lot of uh, rural locations that would like to have these kinds of uh, special events and I think we're in that prime season and six is not meeting the need by any stretch so uh, I'm going to be bringing that back in a week after we get a chance to look at the resolution and come up with a number uh, on what that might be so that the business community can expand the number of events that they can hold I think it's worth a review, to be honest, Commissioner Karski. Is that six per vendor? That it is. Okay. And um, I'll just give you an example. Johnny Carino says they have that many in a week requests, um, and there's other individuals that have already expressed their interest in doing this. And even with the growth of, let's call it, the event centers, the many event centers that are barns or whatever they used to be that have been remodeled. <clears throat> Trying to find a location is just about impossible. In fact, I heard that one of the places is booked out for over a year. So that's interesting. Just Commissioner? Curious, um, the cost to like a, an event center having their own liquor license <laughs> versus, versus the one day what what do, do we know the difference we do but I don't remember it go ahead Olivia that's a pretty significant difference I'd say um, I don't know the exact number but a liquor license is in the thousands of dollars whereas a one day license is like 50 to 100 bucks depending on what you're selling so are we gonna be looking at the cost then too you can adjust to. that too okay yep I think it's all at once. All on the table? Okay. All on the table, yep. I think the liquor license is different in the, in the county as it is in the city, and so it would be good to have both of those numbers what they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the city is a lot more expensive. Yeah, quite a bit more. Commissioner Barth? Um, the liquor license in the county, and we have a couple that are available, is based on the population of the largest town near it. So, for example, the Crooks Gun Club wanted to get a liquor license, and it turned out that they were closer to Sioux Falls than Crooks. Oh and it was going to be $250,000. So they feel more comfortable getting, uh, uh, you know, a one-day license uh, 25 times a year. Now, I, uh, admittedly, we don't allow that right now, but there's a grocery chain here in town that caters, and so they have their eight different grocery stores 
cater six events each, and uh, they manage to show up at Crooks Gun Club uh, as often as needed. <laughs> Commissioner Ben. Yeah. Certainly. <coughs> um, just uh, Bill Hoskins, director of the Siouxland Heritage Museums. We uh, have a lot of uh, one-day liquor licenses that we deal with with the museum system, primarily through the rentals. A lot of people, as part of their wedding receptions, are, are going through a process. They're going through it through the city of Sioux Falls, but uh, any time a nonprofit has a fundraising event or anything, they also may be going through the same process. So I, I think I would strongly encourage you to look at those. I, th I think there's a real need within the county. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a huge need. Um, there's a significant difference between the city's structure and the county's structure. And uh, frankly, to be competitive, and most of the time the people that are doing this are um, really don't have an alternative. And uh, I think it's time for us to review that. Six is not very many. So anyway, any other new business? Uh, or old business, I guess we're at. Uh, with that, we'll go into uh, executive session for personnel contracts on litigation. That's my motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second for exec session for personnel contracts and litigations. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. We'll be back in five minutes. <laughs>